You're listening to the latest sermon from Our Saviour Lutheran Church in Fareham. For more information about Our Saviour Lutheran Church, visit our website at www.oslc.org.uk. oslc.org.uk. May God bless you richly through his word. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your Son Jesus Christ brought peace and joy to the disciples when he appeared amongst them and spoke peace to them. So we pray that you would now speak peace to our hearts through the knowledge of your Son, so that in him we might have everlasting life and salvation. This we ask in his holy name. Amen. Peace be with you, said Jesus on the evening of the first Easter and also the following Sunday when Thomas was with the other disciples. Peace be with you. Now, shalom, peace, is a standard greeting in Hebrew. If you go to Israel, that's the one word you definitely need to learn, shalom, and it means hello but it also means peace. And when the Gospels, written in Greek, when they transmit the words of Jesus and the Apostles, they, generally speaking, just turn it into normal idiomatic Greek. And just every now and then, every now and then, the Greek that comes out of the pen of the evangelists is not idiomatic Greek, but is clearly a translation directly from the Hebrew or the Aramaic. And generally speaking, when that happens, it's worth stopping and thinking, why did they do that? So sometimes you have people just saying, the Greek for greetings. Um, Different languages do this differently. English is a little bit unhelpful in, in Britain. Hello doesn't really mean anything other than hello. But if you go to Australia or Germany, they'll say good day. 
and immediately becomes something more than just a hello. It's a wishing of a good day, just like we say good morning and good evening to one another. In uh, the, the Romans greeted each other by wishing each other health. And Greeks greeted each other by wishing each other joy. So they said to, they met somebody else and they said, joy, I may you have some. And then the greeting was you too, joy to you too. But here, the evangelist John has not given us the Greek greeting, but he has translated the Hebrew greeting which didn't mean anything, or didn't mean anything, but didn't mean greeting to a Greek ear. In other words, it's a bit like when British people go to Australia and people say good day to you. Immediately it kind of sticks out, we don't, we don't say that at home. And it makes you sit up and pay attention. Or if sometimes you have a conversation with somebody who's not a native speaker, and they use some idiom from their own language, and you have to really stop and think, well, what does that mean in English? You know, they, they could translate the expression too literally. And it immediately stops you again in your tracks and say, I have to think about that, what that might mean. And so also when John tells us that Jesus came and didn't just say hello to the disciples, but he said, peace be with you. And he doesn't just translate the word peace, but also the be with you, peace to you. He makes it emphatic, he makes it stand out. And this is something that we perhaps don't pay enough attention to. Maybe next Sunday you, you'd care to sit through the service and just have a little tally sheet in your, uh, you know, in, your, in your palm and just count how many times the word peace occurs in the service and where it occurs. It's a word that we use all the time in church, it's a word that occurs all the time in the Bible. But I wonder how often we've stopped to think about what it actually means. Very, very many years ago, I purchased a second hand set of the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, produced either side of the Second World War by the top German biblical scholars. It took all the significant words of the Greek New Testament and, re and then wrote articles on what exactly they meant. It runs to 10 volumes, and each volume is about 1,000 pages. I got it at a good price. It takes up a lot of shelf space. And so I looked up the word peace, or the Greek word for peace, in that dictionary, and that was about a 15, 16 page article, what the word peace meant in Greek literature of the antiquity, what the Greek word peace meant in the Old Testament, what the peace meant, word peace meant for the, in the rabbinical literature, what the word peace meant in the Greek Old Testament, Septuagint, how it was used in uh, first century Greek literature in general, uh, and finally, what it means in the New Testament. There's a lot of learning in that article. And a couple of things stood out from that exhaustive study. The first thing is that that word peace means an awful lot more than the English word does. Generally speaking, we use the word peace to mean either cessation or the absence of war. And that's one key, key word, yeah, key mean. There is no war, there is no end of conflict. And then we use it kind of metaphorically for a sense of calm, sense that your life is under control and you are contented, so that I have, I, I feel peaceful. But the Hebrew word shalom, its primary meaning is not the absence of war or conflict, but its primary meaning is all-round well-being. All-round well-being, general welfare. So that if you have this peace, it means that all is well. That very famous phrase from Juno of Norwich. All things shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. That's what is meant by this word, peace. And therefore it is in, this, in the Bible, primarily and chiefly, 
something that God gives to his people. We heard in the prophet Ezekiel of this, the vision of the Valley of Bones, which was a picture of Israel in exile. God's people had received redemption from Egypt, from slavery. They had received the promised land and all its blessings. They had received a kingdom. They had received peace from their neighbors. And all the way through, they responded to God's gift by being disobedient, by being idolatrous, by generally speaking, acting as if it wasn't a gift from God at all, but either something that they had procured or something that they should be seeking from elsewhere. And eventually, God then allowed Israel's enemies to overpower them, overcome them, and took the people to exile. And so in the late 6th uh, six, uh, six century BC, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, and the people were taken away to Babylon. And it is to these people in Babylon to whom Ezekiel is prophesied. And what God is promising them is that he will restore to life this dead nation that has had its people, its capital, and its place of worship removed. They've been decapitated, if you like. And he will bring them back to life and bring them back to their own land. And they will enjoy again, once more the blessing of God in the original setting. All things shall be well and all manner of things shall be well once more. They will have peace. That peace is a gift of God which he bestows on those, whom, on whose, on those upon whom his favor rests. This also was the message of the angels on the, birth of Je on the night of Jesus' birth. Peace on earth, and then depending on your translation in our liturgy's way, uh, and on earth, peace among, uh, peace, goodwill towards men. Or perhaps more accurately translated from the, uh, from the Bible, peace on earth and goodwill to those upon whom God's favor rests. That's what the angels sang that the uh, birth of Jesus had signaled. The birth of Jesus is the ultimate act of peacemaking by God. It is peacemaking in that sense of the absence of conflict. The fall into sin, Adam's de disobedience with Eve, was an act of disobedience and brought man into conflict with God. And the history of mankind and the history of each of our personal histories is essentially history of that conflict. God says, come and I want to go. God says, right, I want left. God says, don't, and I say, yes, I will. And that brings us into conflict with him, and it is also a history of conflict one with another. Just recently, somebody in, in the United States, of course, started a, an online campaign trying to discourage people from ever having children again, saying that having children is selfish. And if you can think of one unselfish reason to have children, go ahead, but there aren't any. And the reason is that this is such a horrible and terrible world that to bring people on here who have no choice in the matter is an act of cruelty and unkindness. Why would you do such a thing? You can see how Maris is suffering, having been brought to the world. No say in it at all, right? Why would you do such a thing? But of course, to say that, look at the world today and say, the world is such a terrible place, implies that somehow it's become worse than it ever was. Whereas in fact, the opposite is the case. If you go all, you know, into almost any century or decade, let's say in, before 1800, and you compared life there with life today, I'm pretty confident that even if you could take modern dentistry with you, you wouldn't want to stay. You want to come home, right home again. The prosperity and the general absence of violence from so many people's lives has never before been seen. In fact, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, I learned, used that word peace to mean that extraordinary and unusual state of affairs when there isn't war. They assumed the ancient Greeks, they assumed that war was the normal state of affairs, and when there was a cessation of war, we had a little bit of a breather, you call that peace. Peace was the abnormal state of affairs. And that's been the case always and everywhere. If you despair of the war zones of the world, 
whether it's the Middle East or the Horn of Africa, wherever. That was the history of almost anywhere, almost at any time, until about yesterday. But even today, war keeps breaking out. And he will keep breaking out so long as you've got more than two people on earth. In fact, more than one, probably. I remember a pastor's wife having a conversation with a couple of other church members um, in my student days, and they were kind of talking about original sin. And one of the young people in this conversation said that they devised an empirical proof, an empirical test for proving original sin. And the proof was this. You put two children in an empty room with, an ident- with a toy and leave them there for about a minute and there you can see original sin take over. And the pastor's wife who's had more experience in life than that said, no, 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 you don't need that. I have got a better, cheaper experiment. Put two children in an empty room with two identical toys and leave them for a minute and you will see what original sin does. They will still fight. The absence of conflict is the unusual state of affairs in human affairs. Because what sin does, it pits us against the whole world. By separating ourselves from the true God who is our father, who is our provider, our maker and provider, we are left alone in a hostile universe trying to make the most of it. And we think that it's a good thing that we are in control. We think that what we want is autonomy. We think that when we are self-sufficient, then all things are well. Whereas in fact, in that moment, we have isolated ourselves from everyone and everything, chiefly from God. A healthy state of affairs is where we all live under God's care and we live in mutual provision and mutual dependence in harmony, where each looks out for the welfare of the other and provides for the welfare of the other. And so all are provided for at all times. Those who have more care for those who have less. Those who have skill care for those who have no, none, and so on. And yet, where can you find a community that runs, that operates like that for any longer than about half an hour? And the church is no exception. If you come to church looking for the lovely, beautiful community where people actually live nicely and lovingly with one another, be prepared for disappointment. We're just the same as everybody else out there at our heart. Sin does not stop at that door. It walks right in here as well. This conflict, this warfare with man against God, with people against one another, this is what Jesus came to abolish. And he came to abolish it not by teaching us how to be better people, which is a little bit like when you're trying to teach your dog to sing. You might make some results just worthy of YouTube, but it will not be, your dog will never get a gig at Covent Garden. Because it goes, uh, you're fighting against nature, and you might come, you know, you might achieve some superficially pleasing results. But if you cannot change nature, you will always lose in the end. Instead, God dealt with this by bringing peace into the world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who made peace in his own body. In the body of Jesus, we had God and man in perfect harmony in the one person. In Jesus Christ, there was no conflict between God and man because he, the son of God, the son of Mary, was in his very person, the harmony and the unity of God and man. And moreover, he was obedient to his Father in all things, even up to the cross, so that he nailed our sins in his body to the tree of the cross, taking away the cause of all the misery by taking away our sin. So in the body of Jesus, we find peace. Which is why Jesus, we're told that Jesus came and stood among the disciples and said, Peace be with you, and show them his hands and his side. As is to show, this is why I can boldly and confidently proclaim peace to you, because look at me, I was crucified. Your sins were nailed to the tree of the cross. I came to remove 
the root cause of the hostility and the enmity. And therefore also Jesus came to establish that bigger, broader peace, that shalom, that all-round well-being. Because he came to bring about new life. New life that is not determined by the laws of nature only or by the laws of eco economics or the laws of psychology or any other thing that is merely a phenomenon on this earth. He came to bring about, establish a new order, a new creation, which is a creation of God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit who is able to raise the dead and it can take sinful men and women and children and give them forgiveness in the name of Jesus and having cleansed them from their former sins, begin to shape and to mold them according to his will. Working against and with nature working with what God has created against our sinful nature through the forgiveness of our sins and the training in righteousness that comes by his power through the Holy Word. This peace is only found in Jesus and it is only found in the body of Jesus. This is why that word peace keeps cropping up. Think of where it comes up in the Bible. Think of where it comes up in the church's liturgy. It comes just before we receive the Lord's Supper. The peace of the Lord be with you always, we say. It comes just before we read the Gospel. Glory be to God, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. It comes in the Agnus Day, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. And at the end of the sermon, we have the custom of, of the proclamation, of hearing the proclamation, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What do all those things have in common? The presence of Jesus in his word or in his body in the sacrament of the altar. Jesus came to bring peace by his sacrifice on the cross. And he now brings it to us by the power of his resurrection. Jesus is already living in the human flesh in perfect harmony with God beyond the reach of sin and death. He is risen from the dead, never to die again. And what he offers to us is a participation and a sharing in that life of his, in that peace. And it comes through repentance. It comes when we cease to seek self-improvement, seek to uh, cease to seek self-sufficiency and autonomy, and instead acknowledge God as God and His true word as true. And where He calls out our sin, we acknowledge it, and we seek to live by His will, no longer by self-will. And it comes through faith when we receive forgiveness of sins, when we trust place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who forgives us our sins and takes away the cause of enmity and conflict with God, takes away the cause of misery and suffering, and grants us that well-being that can be only found in life in harmony with God in Jesus Christ. And therefore we have that peace, peace and that peace does surpass all understanding. Because it is a peace that the world cannot see. It is a peace that you cannot necessarily feel or measure. And nevertheless, it remains real. Martin Luther once pointed out that this peace does not mean, it's not a peace that you feel because all your troubles are away. It's a better peace than that. It is a peace that you have, especially when you are troubled. Because when you are troubled, nevertheless you know that God is your Father who loves you. How do you know that? Because he gave his Son to die for you. And when the world strips us bare of any joy, of any hope, we still have true hope and true joy in that peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Because the world cannot take it away from us. Because it is a gift of God. We are God's people and we have a better hope than the exiles of Israel. We have a hope not only of a life in our, on our own plot of land with freedom from earthly enemies, 
but we have a promise of eternal life in God's new creation, which Jesus has brought about by his suffering and death. And that peace is for the whole world. Jesus wishes his name to be proclaimed in, to all creation so that all may know it, so that people might be not only spared anxiety and spared despair, but better that, than that, that they might be spared also the false and fleeting hopes that this world offers. So that our peace of mind and our peace with one another is not based any longer on things that are so hard for us to control and which ultimately overpower us, but is rather guaranteed from heaven. And this is also finally where true Christian community will come from. You will not find it in any gathering of actual on earth Christians. Conflicts will arise because the sinful nature hasn't departed us. But when we seek to hear the voice of Jesus who proclaims peace not only to me but also to you and therefore calls me to live in that peace then that peace begins to be possible this is where the unity of Christians will ultimately be found in this fractured church of ours not in us just getting along and ignoring our differences but rather us seeking together the voice and the presence of Jesus in his word and in those places where he's promised to be in the Holy Sacraments, in our gathering together. So that as we draw near to Jesus together, we find that the gaps between us begin to disappear. This process will always be incomplete in this life, but it is nevertheless one to one, one to which you have all been called. But however successful or unsuccessful our earthly efforts are, this peace cannot be taken away from us. Because we have been made one with our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives, who himself is our peace. He himself has sanctified us. He has reconciled us to the Father and therefore to one another. And he is here today. His peace is, a, his, is God's gift to us this day also. You may or may not feel it right now in your heart. You may or may not remember it by five o'clock to this afternoon when you're back in your homes, but it is nevertheless true and real, not merely as an experience, but something far more certain, a gift of God, which you will not withdraw or regret. So may that peace be yours now, in this week to come, and throughout your days on earth, until God has put away all enemies and all enmity, and his eternal peace will be our eternal possession. Amen. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.